Uh, can you all hear me? Okay, uh, my name is Anjali Cannon. I'm a software engineer at Google. And um, just a little quick background on me and my team. Um, I'm on the Google Brain team. The way I always explain Google Brain is that we kind of do all things machine learning. So some people work on research, some work on applying that research to problems around the company. Um, some people work on infrastructure like TensorFlow. I consider myself to be at the boundary between research and applications um, with a specific focus on natural language processing. So, um, um, a couple, couple years ago, I guess, I was pretty excited when I heard about a feature that some people in the Gmail team wanted to implement. And the way this, this feature was explained to me is, is described well by this mock. And this isn't what the feature looked like in, pr in production, it's just a mock that they came up with uh, to kind of demonstrate their insight. So their idea was, say you, say you take a look at this email. Can you do Tuesday or Wednesday? Now, I didn't receive this email, and nor did you, but you could probably guess what the recipient of this email might have responded. They might have said, I can do Tuesday, or I don't want to do Wednesday, or either is good for me. And so the Gmail engineers looked at this and they said, well, if you don't need any prior knowledge to at least come up with some plausible replies, why can't we just surface those replies to the user? And the reason this would be useful is because then if the user likes one of those, they can tap on it and send it, and it just saves the time and the frustration of trying to type on a mobile device. So uh, when I heard about this, um, I, I thought it was pretty fascinating because it, it seems simple on the surface, but there's actually a lot going on under the hood to do something like this. First, you have to kind of look at the original message and extract some meaning from it. Then you have to kind of understand how, you know, given the meaning of the original message, what should the meaning of the outgoing message be? Like, what is sort of the correspondence there? Then you actually have to generate language. And probably the most interesting part about this to me was that you have to do all of this in a way that is very robust to the tremendous diversity with which um, people communicate in email. First of all, email handles many, many different scenarios. People are talking about all sorts of different things. Second of all, people have all different types of styles and tones that they're going to be using in their email. And so in a problem like this, we would want to avoid something that's really dependent on like brittle, hard, handcrafted rules and scenarios. So um, fast forward some months, and we actually did launch this into production um, last year. And uh, this is what it looks like um, in production. Here's just an example. It, I can't read that from here. But it's something about you know inviting people over for dinner. And the suggested replies are things like count me in. Uh, we're, we're free, and sorry, I can't make it. Um, OK, so why is this worth talking about today? Well, at the surface, this seems like a simple problem. You get an email, you produce an email that goes back. But as I was starting to describe before, um, this task is actually fairly challenging because there's a number of kind of subcomponents that all sort of have to happen at the same time. And if you look at these things I've listed here, um, things like extracting meaning from the previous message, um, understanding the call and response, entering language. If you think about what a model that can do all of this basically is, it's really a dialogue model or a conversation model. Um, meaning if we had, if we, if we could solve all these problems very well, um, we could make progress on actually building a model that can plausibly converse with a human. And the ability to plausibly converse with a human is often cited as a, a key component of how we imagine an AI. Um, so I, I think this, this problem is very interesting um, because <clears throat> it really kind of forces us to make progress on, on one of these things that we kind of think of as a key component of AI. So that's why I think the problem is interesting. Why is our solution interesting? Well, the model that I'm going to go on to describe, uh, the reason I think is interesting is because <clears throat> it's <clears throat> learned entirely from data. There's no handcrafted rules. There's no handcrafted scenarios. It's totally based on the statistics of the data. <clears throat> now, sorry, speaking to a machine learning audience, that's probably not a surprise. Or you know, you're, yeah, you're, you're probably like, well, that was obvious. You're speaking at MLConf. <clears throat> um, but the reason I think this is worth noting is because historically, on these types of problems, um, building dialogue models or conversation models. Oh, thank you. That's very kind. Thank you. Thanks. Um, yeah, historically on these types of problems, it is very common to rely on these scenarios or rules. Um, and I, I'm not at all saying that 
using that type of knowledge is not useful, but I think what we've developed here is a very complementary approach. Um, and I'll explain later on what I think this model can do that those can't do and kind of why these fit together nicely. But I do think the idea that on a task where you're interpreting and generating language, we built a completely data-driven solution was actually kind of a surprising result. Okay, so over the next five or 10 minutes, um, what I'm gonna do is talk a little bit more about the model that we built. Um, and really what I just hope to convey here is, is how powerful it is that, that we have the technology to do this sort of thing and, and learn this type of model fully from data. So, okay, so the model is a neural network and I'm assuming everyone in this room, um, particularly after the last talk, is familiar with neural networks. Um, I don't know if you're necessarily familiar with recurrent neural networks, so I thought I would just go through like a really quick review. Um, it'll just be two minutes, so if this is all review, um, don't worry, it won't last that long. Okay, basically, neural networks, the uh, basic component is the neuron. The neuron has some inputs and some weights associated with those inputs. The output of the neuron is the um, product of the weights with the inputs summed and passed through a nonlinearity. So you can kind of think of it like a little logistic <laughs> regression. Um, what's really powerful about neural networks is when you compose those neurons together, you can get a very powerful function approximator. Kind of the prototypical, um, you know, common uh, problem that you're all very familiar with probably is the idea of handwritten digit recognition. So in this case, the input is an image of a handwritten digit, it's the pixels of that image, and the output is a label of what digit it is. Okay, so that, that's probably all very familiar to you. But now coming back to the smart reply problem, the input is an email and the output is an email. So it's not immediately obvious how we would take your kind of vanilla neural network and adapt it to this problem. So um, again, I apologize this is review, but uh, what we use is actually a recurrent neural network, which is common when the input or output are natural language. It's typical to use a recurrent neural network. <clears throat> so the difference between a recurrent neural network and a traditional feed-forward neural network is that the recurrent neural network has some state that's persistent across time. So a feed-forward neural network would get, uh, you know, one input, one static input, and then, you know, when it sees a new input, that's treated completely separately. In a recurrent neural network, there is a persistent state and it can read a sequence of inputs um, and update its state at each input. So if you prefer to see things mathematically, um, you can see here there's this additional equation where the hidden state is a function of the previous hidden state. It's not purely a function of the inputs. Um, if you prefer to see things more visually, you know, a feed-forward neural network gets one input, gets not necessarily one input, but it gets an, just one time step worth of input, one time step worth of output. A recurrent neural network it can get a whole sequence. So in this case, we're seeing it get a whole sequence of words. That is good, and then it might have some output there. Okay, so it's kind of the difference between seeing a word versus a sequence of words, which could be a sentence or a document, or in our case, an email. Okay, so just to make things slightly more complicated, um, in our case, it's actually not just one recurrent neural network, it's actually two recurrent neural networks. This idea is called sequence-to-sequence -sequence learning or encoder-decoder models. The idea is that the first, uh, the first network is an encoder. It's uh, reading in the incoming message in our case, and the second network is the decoder, and it's going to generate the reply email. Okay, so I've kind of glossed over a lot of details there, so I'm gonna go a little bit more deeply talking about inference and training of this model. Um, oh, one quick point I wanted to make before moving on. Even though this is two networks, we still train this end to end. So we still think of this as one model, um, but it's conceptually useful to think of it as two networks. Okay, so I'm just gonna step through a little bit slower to explain how this is actually used in practice. So say we have a trained model, I'll come back to training in a moment, but let's just assume for the moment that we have an already trained model. This is how we would use it in practice. We feed the, um, an incoming email into the first neural network one token at a time. And so at each time step, the neural network is updating its internal state such that the state at any given time is sort of a representation of um, the words that it's seen so far. So by the end here, the um, internal state, which is represented by that kind of bluish box, the internal state is a fixed dimensional encoding of the message, how are you? Then this, uh, oh yeah, there it is then this encoding gets copied over into the decoder. So we initialize the decoder's hidden state with that representation of the incoming email. And now we're gonna ask the decoder to generate an outgoing email conditional 
on that um, encoding, okay? Now, how are we going to generate an email? As I said before, well, it's, it's a little bit, um, there's two things to clarify here. One is that we're gonna do it, we're not just gonna spit out an email, we're gonna do it one token at a time, just like we read in the email one token at a time. And the second important thing is that we're not actually outputting a token at any given time step, we're outputting a distribution over all the tokens in the vocabulary. So it's, it's not really a token that it's submitting, it's, you know, it's, it's something like this. So after how are you, maybe the distribution that it emits, really the distribution will be over the whole vocabulary, which could be tens or hundreds of thousands of words. But for simplicity, maybe it's just something like, you know, 0.5 I, 0.3 the, and 0.2 we, and that's its distribution. Then, if, if this were inference time and we were trying to generate an email, we would choose something from the distribution, which could either be done as randomly sampling the distribution, or we might greedily take the highest probability thing, we feed that in, and then we get a distribution over the next token. So basically, what we're doing here is the decoder is going to give us a distribution over possible replies. Um, and it's up to us kind of how to use that distribution. We can sample from it, we can um, greedily just try to get a, a, we can greedily try to compute the most likely reply by always taking the most likely token, or we can do something a little bit less greedy, um, like a beam search. Um, in the case of a beam search, we would, instead of just taking the most likely token, take the, say, k most likely tokens, feed all those in, and now we have k prefixes, and then maybe k next tokens for each of those, so we have k squared kind of prefixes, and then take the top k from there and repeat. If you didn't understand the details of that, it's not very important. The point is, there's various strategies we can use once we have this distribution. It's very powerful. So putting that all together, um, this is kind of just a repeat of what I just showed you, but feed in the incoming message one token at a time, generate the outgoing message one token at a time. Okay, so the resulting model is fully generative. And like I said, we're just gonna use the output distribution to approximate the most likely responses, typically in practice using a beam search. Um, now for training, um, the training data is going to be, a in, in our case, was a historical corpus of email, and the emails are organized into pairs of an email and the reply email. Um, and we train the whole thing end to end, as I mentioned before. And in training, we are basically trying to maximize the likelihood of the um, reply email. This is just, you know, looking at one email. We're trying to maximize the reply of one email given um, the incoming email. And that's just the product of the um, softmax distributions. It's just the product of the, um, the probability at each, at each time step. Okay, so that is really all I'm gonna say about the model for now, but the key points I wanted to make are that everything is learned from data, even the features. So there's, you probably noticed I didn't say anything about pause tags, I didn't say anything about dependency parsing or entity tagging or anything like that. Um, all these notions of grammar and kind of like what constitutes a sentence, the model just learns directly from the data. The second key point I wanted to make is that one really important thing about this model is that it addresses this issue I mentioned before where we want, we want the model to really be um, able to handle the great diversity with which people communicate. And the way this model is able to do that is that, like neural network models in general, it's able to smooth across the language variation. So in the same way that you know the handwritten digit, um, handwritten digit recognizing model, it kind of just learns this overall concept of what a four is, just because it sees lots of different fours, and those fours might all be in different handwritings, but it just has this like general idea of you know the three strokes that make a four. Similarly, with this model, whether it sees you know how are you or how are you doing today or what is your state today, it's going to kind of learn to smooth across those various. Um, those variations in the language um, because it's compressing them to this fixed dimensional encoding. And so it's gonna learn that all those kind of get the same reply. That's like a very high, high level hand wavy explanation, but that's just kind of one of the broad points I wanted to make about the model and, and how it really addressed our needs here. Okay, so smart reply in production, does this actually work? Well, we, we did deploy it last year. If you use Inbox by Gmail, then you should be seeing these. And our, our, probably our clearest metric of success here is that this feature is now used to assist in more than 10% of mobile replies in Inbox. So people are using it. Um, 
you know, another way that we kind of understand success is just looking at our own emails and seeing, you know, you know, I feel like this is actually more convincing to me to, to see it actually saying sensible things. So this first email says something about, uh, you know, asking someone whether they managed to complete some task on some, you know, group project. And the suggested replies are things like, yes, it's done, working on it now, or, or I haven't yet. Um, one kind of detour point that I wanted to make about, about this model in production, though, is that, as I mentioned before, everything is learned from the data, and there's, there's not a lot of, um, you know, it's, it's going to learn what to say based on the data. And so one issue with that is that, you know, we, um, we don't have a lot of, con well, one issue with that is that people, not all people communicate in the same way. So some people might want to communicate in a very formal way with correct grammar and no slang. Other people might communicate in a way that is not totally grammatically correct and uses a lot of slang. Um, so, so one thing we realized early on was that if we wanted to, ha if we wanted to make this product have kind of a, um, you know, just be gr grammatically correct and you know speak in, in proper English, we would need to limit a little bit what it could say, and simply black sim simply restricting the vocabulary would not be sufficient because it wasn't just a matter of not wanting to say certain words. So if you look at this first example, you are the best. Clearly, we didn't want to take any of those three words out of the vocabulary. We just, we don't want it to, to say you're the best with that kind of your because that's, um, that's the wrong your. So we actually in production, um, any of you who have used this will have noticed probably that it's really restricted to a valid set of responses. Um, the model itself is fully generative. It, it can just generate language on its own, um, but we just sort of restrict it to only be able to um, use some of the things that it generates. Um, and the only reason I, I mention that little detour is because uh, that allows me to explain this next diagram. This is just, you know, sometimes people say, you know, they're kind of wondering when is this most useful or, or when, when does this actually come in handy, particularly before the feature was launched. You know, it, it, was, it was kind of unclear, are people actually going to use this? When is it going to be useful? Um, that long bar at the bottom is the, sorry, these, uh, these are all um, semantic clusters. So these aren't like actually responses, but these are kind of semantic clusters into which the responses fall. So the really long bar at the bottom is the thanks cluster. So that is the most frequent case in which people are using it. But they use it in many different case, cases too, to say things like, um, I got it, no I didn't, will do, yes I am. Um, and so it's, it's not merely just kind of like, you know, ignoring the email just saying thanks or something like that. They're actually um, expressing some, some meaning by using these. Okay, so, so that's kind of a, a little bit about how we um, have taken a look at the model in production. And if you're interested in more metrics, there is, there's a bunch more metrics in our KDD paper, and I, I have some extra slides too. I wasn't sure if we would get to them, but there are, there are more metrics where we've actually um, kind of done some ranking evaluations and things like that. <clears throat> um, but for now, I, I wanted to kind of move on um, to talk about really the limitations of the model. So what can it do and what can't it do? So first let's talk about what, what it can do. So going back to the example from the beginning of the talk, the, the, uh, that example in the mock was, can you do Tuesday or Wednesday? So this is the kind of raw output from the model, not restricted to any um, whitelist. This is the raw output. And you can see it says things like, I can do Tuesday, I can do Wednesday. Tuesday works for me, Wednesday works for me. Um, and so what we're seeing from this is that it, it has learned some fluency. These are all, you know, complete grammatical sensible sentences. Um, these are all fairly plausible responses to this question. Um, it's, it's kind of learned um, to, to take words from the original message and put them in the response, things like Tuesday and Wednesday. So there's no templating here. There's no like, it's not like we kind of left a placeholder and copied it in or anything like that. It, it just sort of, you know, learns that if someone gives you these two choices, it should respond with one of them. Um, so that's some things it can do, um, but there's still a lot of things that it can't do. So um, one, one thing that um, people say a lot, even I notice this when I'm using it, is that it, it doesn't match every user's style or tone. Um, so sometimes it's even things as simple as, you know, some people like to use more exclamation points or some people like to use smiley faces. You know, some people want to speak in all lowercase. Um, and the model is, just one global model, and it, it kind of has just like one style, which is a very professional style. 
Another thing the model can't do is ensure that the options, the three options that it presents to users, are going to express diverse intents. So this kind of makes sense because if the, I mean, even just going back to the example I showed, this kind of makes sense. So if the top, if the top most likely response is something like, well, actually this isn't a very good example because these aren't even that similar, but if the question was something like, um, does Tuesday work for you? And let's say the top response was something like, yes, it does. Um, the next most likely response is probably going to be like, yes, it does, but with a comma. Or like, yes, it does with an exclamation point. Or sure, it does. It's going to be something very similar. And this makes sense because, um, you know, just the, the uh, it, it wouldn't, we wouldn't want a model that would, you know, take two things that are basically synonymous and give them wildly different probabilities, right? However, this, we realized early on this was not going to be that useful to users if it's just the three options are all, you know, just like minor variations of each other because it doesn't actually give them like a choice of what to say. Um, so for that, and I, um, I intentionally didn't go into, um, didn't add any slides about this because it's a little bit more to explain, but um, I'll just mention that <clears throat> We, um, we do some post-processing where we use some semantic clustering to understand offline, understand the intents of the different responses, and then we can just do some filtering. So after we get, say, the top 20 responses from a beam search, we can go through and filter out. Instead of giving the top three, we can say, oh, we'll give the top one, but then we'll get rid of the next few because they're redundant or something like that. Um, and there's many different approaches to uh, diversity. That's just the one that we... Um, used at, at the time of launching and that, that's in our paper, but there's, there's many different ways to do that. Uh, but probably the, the, the biggest failing here and maybe like the biggest opportunity um, is that this model, it, it doesn't actually know anything. It doesn't access or update any kind of state or knowledge base. So when it says, can you do Tuesday or Wednesday, it doesn't actually know if you can do Tuesday or Wednesday. It's just going to say, I can do Tuesday. And if someone says, you know, do you like this is just going to say, sure, I do. It doesn't actually know anything. And so I think that is, um, you know, really the biggest limitation of this model for other applications. It, it does seem to have worked well so far in Smart Reply, but in terms of like really thinking bigger, um, which is, sorry, I'm seeing the yellow light, so I'm trying to move it along. But in terms of really thinking bigger about dialogue models, um, that, that is kind of a big limitation of this type of approach. It gives you the fluency and the, you know, the, the kind of smoothness of language. It ultimately, um, you know, we call it smart reply, but it, you know, it, it, it doesn't actually know anything. It's, it's really just kind of going on statistics. So just to wrap up, um, well, I, I kind of just went over this. You know, this, this type of model, the sequence sequence model, showed that if we train, um, if we train this type of model on email and an email corpus, um, we can generate plausible replies to emails, and we, we do kind of learn this notion of fluency and it, it has proved to be useful to some users, um, but it, you know, it, it, still, it still has limitations in terms of um, thinking more broadly about dialogue models. And I, you know, I think it's, it's interesting in the context of dialogue models. It's learned purely from data, which is, is um, a very powerful way to approach this problem, um, but there's still a lot to do here. I think it can be very complementary to other approaches that, that are out there. Lastly, just have to mention, um, Obviously, this was the work of many, many people, not just me. Um, people, other people on the brain team and at Google Research and also a bunch of folks on the Gmail team. Um, that's it.